when I was asked to speak, uh, Jeff wanted to have something on local history. And it doesn't really have much of a tie-in to the Mothman itself, but it has a huge tie-in to Point Pleasant and events that take place in Point Pleasant. I'm going to, I think I'm going to try to speed up and go through it just a little bit so we can get to more on Chief Cornstalk, because uh, I think that may be of, of a little bit more uh, interest uh, to some of you. Uh, when we're looking at the Battle of Point Pleasant, where we're standing now, you're standing on a part of a battlefield. One of the largest battles that ever took place between uh, the Colonials, specifically here Virginians, and uh, any of the native populations. There are many reasons for the, for the Battle of Point Pleasant, Lord Dunmore's Wars is more aptly called. Point Pleasant was just one of the battles. There was actually quite a bit that went into uh, the things that took place here in October of 1774. Leading up, to, leading up to this battle, uh, many things had occurred before. So what we have is we have an indigenous population, your Native Americans, uh, living in this area. And typically, what we find in history are the Shawnee or the main people living here. We have the Shawnee, the Delaware, the Mingo, which are actually a part of the Iroquois uh, nation. And when we look at the, uh, the League of Nations, who actually controlled the Shawnee Nation. And that, that is part of uh, the problem, because everybody thinks that it was just the, the Virginian or the Colonials trying to uh, control the native population, trying to control the Indians, trying to take their lands. When actually, when we look at some of the things leading up to it, it can go back clear to um, the five nations trying to control their subordinates, which were the Shawnee. The, the, all, the, all the treaties that we have, the Treaty of 1763, the proclamations to keep the um, uh, colonials on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains, the, the policy uh, with the proclamation of 1763 after uh, the French and Indian War kept this side of the, of the Appalachians all for the Native Americans, all for the Indians. The problem is they also promised those who fought in the battle land, and the land was in the same area. So we, we, we have uh, several treaties taking place. The first one took and, and, and placed the division between the Virginians and the native populations on the Ohio River. Then later, the Treaty of Hard Labor, I believe it was, took and put the boundary at the Great Kanawha River. So now we have the Ohio River and down the Great Kanawha River. Then the Cherokee come in and they give more land away. None of these Indians live in this area. Everyone who's giving the, the, the land away, the, the Iroquois nations, the Cherokee, none of them live here. The only Indians living in this area are the Shawnee, Lenape, which are the Delaware, uh, the Mingo, several others. They're the only ones actually living here and the land is all being taken away from them by their own peoples. On the other side of that, we have once again the Virginians. For the most part, we're looking at Virginians looking to expand. Part of, our, part of what we were supposed to do was to subdue nature. And, and to settle it, to make it more civilized, which is completely an opposite view of the Native American viewpoint. They're looking at more at living with nature and letting nature take its course and being a part with it. So we're looking to we're looking to gain more land and we're beginning to move into this area. Settlers are ignoring the King's proclamation and beginning to, to move up the New River, up through the, up through the Greenbrier Valley, up into what will become known as the Kanawha Valley, and beginning to settle. As a result of, of those things happening, between the Indians' land being taken away, between the Virginians, or the colonists, wanting more land, because it's our right as Virginians, 
Most people don't realize when the colony of Virginia was formed, it stretched from the Pacific as far west as the king deemed necessary. It could, stretch, could have stretched from Virginia all the way to the Pacific. It didn't. It, it stopped at the Mississippi River. And actually the land that, that we're standing on today was a part of, part of a county called Botetourt County for a while. And Botetourt County, literally the county itself made up the states of parts of Virginia, West Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, and parts of Michigan. It was a huge county. <coughs> but here we are. We, we've got all these things coming together. So we're coming in and beginning to settle. The Indians are, are losing their land. And of course, what's going to happen? There's going to be conflict. And, and at that point, we begin to see uh, people coming down the Ohio River, hunters, long hunters. And that was another problem as far as the Indians went. Because when we hear of long hunters, anybody know what long hair was? They were, they were men who went out on these long hunts. Any hunters in here? How long do you go out? A few hours. A few hours. A long hunter was called a long hunter because they went out on hunts for months. One man was gone so long, his wife thought he was dead, took up with his brother actually, married him, and then he came back. And everybody knows this man's name. His name was Daniel Boone. True story. He, he was gone so long that Rebecca thought he had died and married his brother. And when Daniel came back, of course, she went back to him. But long hunts, they, they were long hunters. Problem with long hunters, they're not hunting for meat, they're coming in for hides. Uh, have you ever, do you remember asking your parents, can I have a few bucks? I mean, that's, you know, everybody, can I have a few bucks? Can I have a couple bucks? That come from the term, from the buckskins. That was their money. Buckskins were worth money. And uh, long hunters are coming in. They're killing randomly, you know, killing as many deer as possible, removing the hides, taking them back, shipping them across to England to be made into clothes. So the, the, native, the natives... Uh, are attacking long hunting parties coming down the river. They're uh, beginning to attack surveying parties coming down the river. Of course, to protect what? Their homes, their food, uh, their very way of life. And when you look at it from the colonist side, you know, they're attacking us. We're just trying to make a living. We're, we're trying to survive. We have all these things coming together in, in really in a, a perfect storm. We see Daniel Greyhouse, one of the one of the um, last things that really really set things off was Daniel Greyhouse, because relationships between the the natives and the colonists were not always bad. There are many times that they were good. They they worked together. They traded together. Um, it, it was not always a thing where they're fighting. We when we think of Indians and colonists, we, you know, we go back to what we see in Hollywood, and we're always fighting one another. Well, we weren't. We were trading, we were working together. Um, well, Daniel Greyhouse, it's a Yellow Creek massacre, he, he had invited these Indians to come across the river for the evening. They had a trading post over there, and uh, he invited them to come over, and after getting them, basically getting the, them drunk, he tried to uh, get a shooting competition. So he allowed the natives, you can have the first shot. And when all the natives had emptied out their muskets, had taken all their shots, they attacked and killed all the Indians. It was just a small party, but within that party was the family of Chief Logan. Chief Logan had always been a friend to the white man, had always been a friend to the white man, uh, invited him into their homes, taking care of them. Uh, he has a great speech. If you ever want to read a, a great speech, read, read Chief Logan's address. At this point, Chief Logan goes on the warpath, and he begins uh, invading uh, the back country of Virginia, 
and <coughs> massacring families on the frontier, wiping out settlements on the frontier. And we are calling for help. And we apply to the governor. The governor at this time is Lord Dunmore. Lord Dunmore had come to the Virginias um, from New York. He had been in New York a short time and acquired quite a bit of land in the short bit of time that he was there. That was another one of those things that, that come into play. It, it's, it, to me, I like to just say it's greed because it, it was that desire for land. So he, he had come to Virginia's uh, to be the governor after leaving New York. And while he's, while he's there, all these problems begin coming up. So here's a perfect opportunity to try to, one, bolster himself up as governor, as military leader of the colony, and two, to possibly gain lands west of the, west of the Appalachian Mountains. So he forms an army. Actually, he forms two armies. One, he's going to lead, and the other army uh, from the western counties is going to be led by Andrew Lewis. Now, Andrew Lewis at this time is a colonel in the Virginia Army. Uh, Everybody assumes that this was all a militia army. They were, but they were well-trained men. Uh, Andrew Lewis was, was a colonel. He had led uh, troops before. Matter of fact, there, anybody ever heard of the Tug Fork River? He led a, he led a uh, expedition up the T Tug Fork River. Did not bring enough food. The, the, his native guides that were with him sort of laughed uh, because of their ill preparation for the trip and uh, the struggles that they had, all the things they tried to carry with them, but the things had gotten so bad they were eating the tugs off their shoes, boiling the leather to eat. They were so hungry. So he had had experience on the frontier. So he puts together the, this great western army and this army uh, consists of close to uh, 1,200 men. Not all of them make them to make it to Point Pleasant at the time of the battle, but a, a great many of them do. Uh, he puts together this large army, and today the area uh, known as Lewisburg is where this army came together. They come together. They're they're drilling. They're practicing. They're they're gathering in their supplies. Matter of fact, this trip he's coming well supplied. He's bringing over fifty thousand pounds of flour. He's bringing with him. What do you think they ate? when they went out on the frontier. When they're camped, when they're camped, the edge of their camp is a stone's throw from where we are. Fish. What else? There is a story about a great fish that was caught while the men were here, and there's a tomahawk made with a fish head on it to represent that, that fish. I've got one, a replica of it. They're eating beef. They're not going out and hunting. They're not hunting. They're not eating turkey. They're not hurting, um, eating deer. They're literally bringing their food wrapped in leather packages known as cattle. Uh, they, they have over 200 cattle still coming with them. Matter of fact, when, when they leave uh, the day of the battle, the cattle haven't gotten there yet. So this is a massive army. Um, they leave Lewisburg. He sends his brother Charles Lewis out. Uh, with, a, with a group of men, and then he sends out William Fleming with a group of men. And they, they march their way down through the New River, across, across through the trails. They get to what is today Charleston. Uh, they set up camp on the Elk River. They build storehouses. And at this point, they build, even build dugout canoes to carry their supplies down to the mouth of the, the Great Ohio River. After everyone catches up, they proceed to Point Pleasant. There's a lot of there's a lot of controversy when it comes to the Battle of Point Pleasant. Uh, is it the first battle of the American Revolution? Uh, is it what is it? I'm going to say it's a, it's a great battle, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to leave it at that point. Uh, there are many things that that can be tied into it. Um, but when we look at when we look at the events to tie it into the revolution, I, I honestly, I'm born and raised in Point Pleasant. We celebrate Battle Days. As a matter of fact, in a few weeks I'll be 
camp down at the point and doing presentations there as Chief Cornstalk. It's a struggle for me to see the tie-in to, to the Battle of Point Pleasant as being a, a Revolutionary War battle. Um, the reasons for that is when we have this battle, we're all fighting under a British flag. We're not fighting under a, a different flag at this point. Although things are happening and there is a lot of concern, we're still fighting under a British flag. Uh, another thing is that there's a story that says that Dunmore set up the Virginia troops so that they could be decimated and he would come in and rescue them and win the battle, win the day, and show dependence upon uh, Crown troops. Well, with Dunmore, there were also militia troops. They weren't all Crown troops. They were just being led by Lord Dunmore. And the other thing is, Lewis, Andrew Lewis, and Lord Dunmore were actually working together at one point, looking for more land. Look, uh, Dunmore sends a message to Andrew Lewis. He's already sent out his men. They're starting to come down the Great, the great Kanawha, and there's a message that comes, and he says, that for, originally he says, meet me at the mouth of the Great Kanawha or another place of my choosing. Now, wait a minute. I, I thought they had to meet at the mouth of the Great Kanawha. No. At the Great Kanawha or another place of my choosing. And he tells him in another letter, he says, meet me at the, meet me at the Little Kanawha. What's today? Parkersburg. He couldn't change the route. So he had to proceed on to Point Pleasant, had to pr pursue on down, on down the, the Great Kanawha to set up his camp in Point Pleasant. The, the pictures I have today, I'm sorry I don't have my, my uh, presentation uh, before us. Uh, my boss likes to say, and it applies to all three of us in the office, we are digital, we are digital men. No, we are A-track men in a digital world, and I messed up my presentation, so I'm doing it the old way. Um, <coughs> the men proceed to the mouth of the Great Kanawha. As they're traveling, all the way, as they're traveling to Point Pleasant, the natives are following them. You can look at the journals uh, of the men who um, were there. And look at look at uh, the orderly books, and natives were spotted here. The natives stole land, uh, horses, sent uh, Matthew Arbuckle and men across the across the Coal River to chase the, the Indians. All the way from the time that Andrew Lewis left Lewisburg to the time that he reached Point Pleasant, Chief Cornstalk knew exactly where they were. The entire way, he knew where they were. Matter of fact, he knew so well um, that he chose to attack Lewis's army instead of Dunmore's army. He could have attacked either one of them. Um, but Lewis's army was a smaller army. For there, there was only two-thirds of the army there. All those beef, they were slowing them down. We, um, William Christian was driving the beef and he was also waiting on some other troops, on some Fincastle troops were, were still coming. So he was delayed in, in arriving at Point Pleasant. Matter of fact, the men in Point Pleasant set up camp on October, there's camp there by October the 6th. We see the attack happening on October the 10th. And the reinforcements with William Christian don't get there until the night, till midnight on October the 10th, that night. So the men, the men are camped here at Point Pleasant. And, it, you know, this is a military campaign, so I expected that when I began researching and looking into everything with the battle, I expected a military camp. But it wasn't your typical, typical military camp because this is a militia army led by, by soldiers. So this camp has half the troops camped up the Kanawha River, a half mile, and a half mile up the Ohio River. We're sitting right now, we, we are sitting right here. Their camp ended right here. It formed a triangle. The area in between is where uh, they would have cattle and they'd have the beeves. And all through here, Lewis, is, Lewis was probably actually set up about where the park is. That's where the magazine was dug and built uh, to protect their supplies, protect their food. 
So they're, they're set up here in this camp. It's a large camp. I mean, you're, you're looking at over 800 men at this point um, set up in camp, really eight to 900 men set up in camp. So here we have this large encampment. The men are resting. Uh, there's, there's a message in a tree from Dunmore telling Lewis to come on and he sends a message, I can't, I've got to rest my men. We have to wait on, our, wait on the beeves to arrive. So they're set and they're resting there. They rest there six days. And across the river, on the other side of the Ohio, and down the Kanawha, there are campfires. You know, we, we assume that psychological warfare is something new. It's not. It's something that's been around for a long time. The Native, the native Army had, had the older men and women set up across the rivers and had fires going at night just to let them know we're here. Also, they were set up there because Chief Cornstalk had a great plan. Chief Cornstalk was a great leader. Uh, when it comes to, to Lord Dunmore's war and the Battle of Point Pleasant, in 1774, Chief Cornstalk was a man of peace. In, 17, in the 1760s, he was a mighty warrior, and it's how he, became, it's how he probably became a great chief. In 1760, uh, 1763, he leads an, a, a raid down through the Greenbrier Valley. He and his warriors go in. They come in uh, as traders passing through. They sit down to this great feast. And as, at his signal, they all rise up and kill every one of the settlers in two settlements except for two people get away. So Chief Cornstalk was well known. He was an a, a, a excellent military leader, and he had a fantastic plan. See, years ago, there used to be a, a native village right here. It's just off the map. There's a creek. Uh, today, that, that creek is still called Old Town Creek. Uh, there's a farm called Old Town Farm. That is where Old Town Indian Village was. The Shawnee had a village there. It was a, it was a good sized village, and it was there until the French had gone through planting the leaden plates. Uh, with their planting of the leaden plates and the men coming down the rivers, they said, we, you know, we need to move, and they moved further into the Ohio to get away from, from uh, all the Virginians, all the colonists. <coughs> but Chief Cornstalk crossed his Indian army. They crossed at night and came across at the Old Town lands. And if you follow the railroad today, there's an old railroad track that comes through. And his plan was, he's going to lead his, he's going to lead his army up through. Basically following the railroad track, he's going to send part of them around this way. And his other part was going to come on down the river. Classical Indian style of attack. They, they would attack from two sides. That way they could put fire into an enemy from two different angles. Leaving them no place to no place to go, no escape. They're being attacked from two sides. If they decided to try to retreat, they're coming to the river, but across the river were people stationed for them to cross and, and to be captured or killed if they if they did. So Chief Corstock had an excellent excellent plan. He was going to uh, literally, to use, the, to use the old phrase, he was going to have them for breakfast, which meant they were going to attack before breakfast, before dawn, and be out before it was time to eat breakfast. So, he, he had this brilliant plan. What, actually, what occurred, though, within this camp of Bonnetot and Augusta troops, men are getting hungry because the beef hadn't arrived. And hunters go out. And two hunters happen to go up the river, and they get almost to where uh, Old Town was. At that point, they see the body of Indians. They turn to run. One of them is shot and killed. The other one runs all the way back to camp. And he reports there's acres and acres of Indians. They're everywhere. And Lewis assumes, uh, here we have this, this huge army. This is just another scouting party. Uh, you know, they're coming to see, you know, trying, to make, trying to make some kind of uh, a stand, safe face type of thing. So he sends out 150 of the Augusta troops. 
150 of the Bodata troops. And they begin to move in columns, uh, literally, probably right through this very hall as they begin to march. Uh, the, other, the other troop, one of the Augusta troops are marching along. The bottom top is closest to the river. Augustus is closer to the hillside. They couldn't get clear across the, by the hillside because of the ravines and the creek. And it was very, there was so much brush, which is where Cornstalk planned on sending his warriors down through there so that they would go undetected. Since they were detected, Chief Cornstalk, knowing, brought his Indian army up. And if you've traveled through, if you've traveled through town, you know where the railroad crossing goes across the, the highway, where there's a car wash uh, sitting. He sets his Indian army up across there. And at that point, at that point, he has a, he has this army set up, and it stretches across through here. And here come three hundred. Virginia soldiers and they're marching in two columns they're marching through the forest they're no more than 200 yards apart they can look through the forest at times and, and see each other as, as they're marching as they get to about where the car wash is today just past the old cemetery is another good way of, of spotting it just past the old cemetery here in town the Indians begin to open fire from the hillside, as they open, begin to open fire, they begin, uh, Charles Lewis, Andrew Lewis's brother, is telling, telling his men, form up, form up, form up. And he's standing out in the open. He hasn't gotten behind trees because the way the British Army would work, in this case the militia, same training, well-trained soldiers, they're marching in columns. In time of battle, what they would do is they would swing those columns together to make one massive line to drive the enemy away. So he's yelling for them to form up, to get behind trees, and he gets shot. He's shot. He, he's injured so severely, he turns and, and uh, gives his gun to another soldier and tells them to keep fighting to be brave. And he walks back to camp. He goes back to camp sees his brother, goes to his tent and dies. So Andrew Lewis has lost his brother. The, the firing started over here with, with Charles Lewis and it comes across to the, to the Bonnetot troops where William Fleming is leading. William Fleming is shot three times, twice in the arm, once in the chest. Talk about a tough old guy. He's the head surgeon uh, for the army. He makes his way from the, from the battlefront back to camp. There are other uh, doctors, uh, but not as well trained surgeons. Part of his lung is beginning to stick out of his chest. They can't help him. He literally takes, the records show that he takes and pushes his own lungs back in his chest and seals the hole. He survived. Matter of fact, he goes on and he survives and goes on to many other things in the history of Virginia. At this point, the, the Indians begin to drive the Virginians back. Cornstalk's plan is working. He has all this area with firepower. This whole, this area, firing into a small spot. There's no way the Virginia Army can stand to all this firepower coming into a small area. And they begin to retreat. They retreat as far as, you go out the doors and you look just to the left, you see the railroad tracks, the train trestle going across. Really, it, probably as far as this main road coming into Point Pleasant. The Virginia Army retreated that far. The Indians were, were coming at them hand-to-hand -hand combat at a time until they were able to start sending reinforcements. At this point, the armies are on equal ground. Now the, the, the native army doesn't have a firepower advantage. They're on equal ground, equal spacing, and the Virginia Army begins with discipline and drill and, and, and sheer will to survive. And they begin to drive the native army back. And the bottom top troops begin to push farther. And they push, they push the native army off of this ridge. It doesn't look like much of a ridge, but this is actually a ridge. The Augusta troops begin to come back. 
and they're pushing and they're pushing and they set up as you go through Point Pleasant uh, there's another flood the flood wall there's a hillside and there's a creek that's that creek actually used to run all behind Point Pleasant that's the creek that Cornstalk was sending his warriors up through they get to that point and they have been fighting all day long it's been hand-to-hand -hand combat Times, there are times that it's recorded that the natives ran right up to the barrels of the guns. They're tired. The native army's tired. Neither army is, is, is making much of advance on each other. And Lewis, knowing, he sends a group of men down through Crooked Creek, gets up on the hillside behind Point Pleasant, and if you go outside the doors once again and turn and you look at look back behind Point Pleasant, just across the railroad trestle, you'll see the hillside that the army got upon. They begin to fire into the back of the army, the Indian army. Even though they were too far away to make much of a difference and actually hit any of them, they begin to fire. At this point, remember, Cornstalk knows where everybody is. He knows where Andrew Lewis is. He knows where, where the troops were. He also knows that Will, William Fleming is coming with the cattle and the reinforcements. And he assumes that the men stationed up here on the hillside is this whole other army of, I, I believe it's 150, 200 more men coming. And that's them coming over the hillside. It wasn't actually, but at this point he makes a wise decision. And he withdraws his, his warriors from the field. The Virginia Army collects his dead, retreats back into camp. The Native, Ar the Native Army, uh, as warriors are being killed, many of them are scalping their own or they're throwing them in the river so that, so that the Virginians don't get that opportunity. That night, finally, William Christian arrives. And it's about midnight, and in, the, in his journal it says, We arrived to the moaning of the dead and the dying. They rest for a couple days, and, and Lewis puts together an army. He puts together the men who are, who are able to, to march and to go on, those who are, were not injured. He says, this, this throw up a, a, a shelter. They begin to throw up a, a ragtag fort, something to protect the injured. And he takes his army and he crosses. There's a, there's a creek across the river. It's called, Old, it's called Campaign Creek. He crosses his army there and begins to go to meet with Lord Dunmore. After, after, the, um, after the battle, Chief Cornstalk has taken his, his Indian army, his native army, the, the Shawnee, the Delaware, the, the Mingo, and actually Huron, and um, there's one other one just went blank. But there were several different Indian groups that were fighting together with Chief Cornstalk in this event. They all leave. But Cornstalk's plan was to wipe, out, wipe the Virginians out and then go to Chief Cornstalk, to go to, uh, Chief Cornstalk was going to go to Dunmore and attack his army. Being bolstered up from defeating this enemy Plus the fact now, the fear that would have been in, in Lord Dunmore's troops of this massive Indian army coming. Chief Cornstalk's left alone with his warriors up in, it's around uh, between uh, Circleville and Chillicothe. And he basically, he looks at the men and, the, and the, the young braves and he says, this kill all the women and all the children in this fight till we're all dead. Because he, he knew that there was no way that they would survive this combined army. None of, the, none of the warriors, none of these braves who were so for war. Chief Cornstalk was not really for this war. He was a great war chief, but by 74 he was a peace chief. They asked him to lead because he was a great leader. But he was a man of peace by this time. He wanted to keep the peace. Now all these brave men who wanted to go to war are cowering down and won't say a thing. And Cornstalk at this point turns and says, then I will go and make peace. And uh, the Treaty of Camp Charlotte is signed and 
ends Lord Dunmore's war for the most part. Some interesting things. Andrew Lewis still has an army marching towards them. This army, this army is still coming towards the villages. As they're, as they're traveling along, they've set up several camps and, and Lord Dunmore sent a message, stop, peace, you know, we've made peace, we've settled. And Andrew Lewis keeps marching. He kept marching because there was no place to camp. The terrain was not good for, for his army, so they kept coming a little farther. The Indians began to get worried, and they, they began to take up arms expecting to die. And Dunmore personally goes over to stop them. He, he stops Lewis, stops his army, turns them around, and they come back the very way that they had gotten there. If Lewis's army had gotten more than a half mile to a mile from where they were stopped, they would not have stopped. The, the lands that they were coming to is what were called the burning grounds when they took a captive. They, you had to run a gauntlet through, through the natives um, into the village. And at that time they would beat you with sticks and switches and whatever. And if you made it through, you may be adopted into the tribe, you may be, you may be um, traded, or you may be burnt at the stakes. And just at the spot where they were stopped, they were almost to the place where they had seen their families and relatives who'd come back, who'd survived and escaped. They'd gotten to that point. Things could have been much different if Dunmore hadn't come over. As a result, Dunmore, I mean, Lewis comes back, they build the first drill fort in Point Pleasant, which is Fort Blair, and it was built just to protect the men. Actually, there was supposed to have been a fort here before. Uh, Washington had set up a, a whole line of forts, and this was supposed to be one of them to protect the backcountry of Virginia from attack. The rest of the army leaves. Those who are there, uh, this fort is built. As they, be, as they get healthy, they begin to travel home as well. Many of the men who fought in the Battle of Point Pleasant go on to become great Revolutionary War leaders, captains, majors. Um, throughout the Revolution, we see the men who, who fought in Point Pleasant at this battle being great leaders. Chief Cornstock. Well, Lord Dunmore, let me, let me finish on, on the Virginia side. Lord Dunmore comes back. Uh, he's hailed as a great leader. There are songs written about him. You know, even, even the men who are here were, were praising him. And then a little bit later, we find that Andrew Lewis, the commander of the troops stationed here at Point Pleasant during the battle, is the same one who runs Lord Dunmore out of Virginia. Long history, when we look at revolution, you know, could it be a part of the revolution? We were fighting under a, a, a British flag. We were fighting for our homes. Um, there were no British troops involved with fighting against us. So we we're, were fighting against a massive native army. But no matter how you look at it, this is one of the most incredible uh, battles that ever took place when we look at, at, at Virginia or just colonists and native armies. Now the rest of the story falls to Chief Cornstalk and the Shawnee. They, they've had to give up their they've had to give up their captives. An interesting thing with Lord Dunmore, the Virginians won the battle. They won the war. Usually, when you win a war, you take land. You take what's theirs and make it yours. Lord Dunmore leaves all the native land alone. Leaves the boundary at the Ohio River. Which is one of those things that make people think, ah, he was in collusion with the natives. But the native land is left alone. Indian, the, the white captives are taken uh, and, and brought back to be... Um, Ransom, not ransom, they're brought in as a part of losing the war. So they're brought back to Fort Pitt. Or 
And if you go a few years later, Chief Cornstalk is making visits to this same place, same place where he fought, same place that, that he was defeated. He's coming back to Point Pleasant, bringing in captives from all over the Shawnee Nation. As they're, as they're brought in, they're delivering them. The chiefs who were taken sort of just as assurances that the, the Indians were going to have peace are, are, are coming back. And it's a relatively time uh, of peace as far as Chief Cornstalk is, is concerned. From 1774 to 1777, which becomes the year of the Bloody Sevens, and we see a lot of deprivations on both sides, whether it, it, it was col uh, colonists attacking the natives or natives attacking the colonists. Either way, it was a relatively uh, brief time of peace. In 1777, we find that the Shawnee have been uh, enticed by the British. And you know, look, we didn't take your land after the last battle. Here are all these supplies. They, they begin to trade with them more. They're, they're supplying them. And they finally convince the, the Shawnee to go back to war against the Virginians and fight on the side of the British. And with that, Chief Cornstalk, who has become this man of peace, goes to Fort Randolph here in Point Pleasant. And he, he basically comes to the fort. He and, a, and a, another Indian by the name of Red Hawk, he was a Delaware. He comes to Point Pleasant, comes to Fort Randolph. Little does he know at the time, the Virginians have already gotten word that the, the Shawnee are going to fight for the British. And there's a small army assembling outside the fort. It's a militia army. They're assembling outside the fort. There's, there's close to 200 of them beginning to arrive because they were going to go back up and attack the Indians in their villages to try to prevent this alliance. But he comes to the fort and he basically comes in and speaks with Captain Matthew Arbuckle, who's the captain at Fort Randolph. <coughs> And he tells them that I can no longer restrain my warriors and I must flow like the river and go with them. And we are going to fight on the side of the British. And at this point, Chief Cornstalk is kept within the fort. I didn't put it as, as he's, he's captive or he's taken captive, which is what really happened. But when, when we think of the word taken captive, we think of being tied up, put away, locked up in a building. Uh, Chief Cornstalk was kept within the fort. Chief Cornstalk, Red Hawk, the Delaware, they were kept there in the fort to keep the fort safe from attack. It was a common frontier tactic. If you were in a native village, you would keep a high-ranking official uh, from the enemy within your village so it would not be attacked, so that they're not killed. Arbuck was using the, the exact same uh, the exact same ploy as what the, the natives were using and kept Chief Cornstalk within the fort. Of these men who are camped outside, two of them cross the Great Canal to hunt and they're attacked by a party of Mingo. Oh, before they go, Chief Cornstalk, remember I, I said he's not tied up, kept captive is what we think. He's mapping out other villages. He's mapping out things in Ohio, talking to, talking to the men. He's walking around the fort. His son, Ellen Ipsico, comes to the fort. Chief Cornstalk welcomes him in. And he says, Father, you know, where have you, you know, what's taking you so long? And there's a, you know, there's a speech where, you know, he says, you know, my son, when I was young, I went to war many times, and each time I thought that I may not return. These men, they may kill me today. Uh, basically, the Great Spirit has sent you here to die with me. That's a combination of, of a couple of things that he said. Um, so Alanipsko is welcomed into the fort, and while they were there, these men slip across the Great Canal to hunt. One of them is shot and killed by a party of Mingo. They, they, they attack him. One guy is killed, the other guy gets back to the riverbank and flags down his friends. They come over, rescue him, find the body of the dead one and come back to the fort and they demand revenge. And they come into the fort and they tell Arbuckle and Captain Stewart, basically get out of our ways because we're going to kill the Indians or we'll kill you first, then we'll kill the Indians. So they come in, they shoot Chief Cornstalk with seven to eight musket balls. 
rush the cabin, literally pull Red Hawk down out of the chimney as he was trying to escape. They kill all the Indians instantly. Anybody ever hear the curse of Chief Cornstalk? Yeah. There's a part of a play done in 1921 to make the drama more exciting. There was never such a curse. Chief Cornstalk was a man of peace. He was a great leader. You know, if, if he was around today, he would be a, a great humanitarian. It was all part of a play done in 1921 to make the drama more exciting. The things that have happened in Point Pleasant, uh, the, those bad things with the bridge, uh, bridge falling and, and the jail being blown up, those don't deserve hit, a curse from him. Uh, there's much, a much better legacy, a legacy of peace that I believe he'd rather had. Matter of fact, that legacy of peace went on to his sister, Non Halema. Chief Cornstalk is killed in, in uh, late October, early November at Fort Randolph. And we find his sister, Non Halema, working in the fort when the fort is put under siege the following spring by the same Shawnee. She gave up her, she gave up her home, her leadership up in, up in the Indian lands and came and worked with the Virginians as an interpreter. It's a legacy of peace. Um, when we look at the Battle of Point Pleasant, you know, it, it was a, a, an incredible undertaking for both armies. The Virginia Army putting together these two arms and, and coming to this point. The Native Army, the knowledge that they had, the, the, the network that they had for information and knowing where, where the armies were. Their, their strategies and plans were fantastic. So when you walk through Point Pleasant, as you walk down the streets today, you are, you are literally, if you're walking this way, you're walking through a camp. A huge encampment of, of Virginia soldiers. If you turn and walk this way just a few steps, you are on the edges of the battlefield. And as you drive up through town, you're, you're, to me, you're walking on hallowed ground because you're, you're walking on land where the blood was shed on both sides. And that's a brief history on the Battle of Point Pleasant. Do you have any questions? Yes? I always understood that the French had a role to play in that kind of nudging the Indians into that, that attack. That was always one of the stories that I had heard growing up and everything, but there's, there's nothing to document that. Uh, matter of fact, um, Lord Dunmore took his troops across to Fort Pitt. And he comes down, he comes down the, the Ohio. As he's traveling, he's still sending messages to Chief Cornstalk to meet for peace. This meet for, you know, this meet, this meet. And by that point, Chief Cornstalk has told him, it's, it's too late. We're already, it, it's too late. We're already for war. Um, so as far as finding any documentation, I cannot find any documentation in any literature review or any um, first-person accounts that I can find from any journals of any, any of the history. So it's at that point, no. Now in 77, when we find Chief Cornstalk being killed, yes, the British have fully gotten the Indians on their side. But at this point, no. Uh, Dunmore still, you know, he's looking for land. He gained lands in New York. He's looking for land here. He's looking to build himself up as a great leader, military leader, uh, showing reliance on the British rule for the others, because things are already happening uh, in the colonies. We already see other things happening and taking place and beginning. It's, it's getting close, but there, there's no place that's documented of any actual British influence as far as the Indians go on that side of it. But I always, I'd always heard the same thing. Always heard the same thing. And I just assumed, oh, that's it. And we are recognized as the first battle of the American Revolution. And I'm not going to knock that, but just personally, it, it's a great battle that took place. Any other questions about the battle itself? Yes, sir? I got here a little bit late, but what started the battle between the Virginians and the Indians? Uh, the battle, it was a combination of a lot of things but between both native and uh, colonial troops taking native land. Uh, deals taking away their land, their hunting land, that they had no control of. Uh, the, the League of Nations, they're up more towards New York, Pennsylvania. Uh, the Cherokee are down more in North Carolina, 
South Carolina, and they're both giving away the very land we're standing on. And neither one of them had control of the land. The Shawnee were actually subordinate to the Iroquois. The Iroquois had driven the Shawnee out. Um, the Shawnee really hadn't lived in this area much longer than the colonists had been in, in the New World. They were, they were a very nomadic people, and the Iroquois had driven them away. So we find uh, the loss of land, loss of hunting. We see uh, depredations on both sides. We have the, the colonials killing the Indians. We find Indians constantly attacking the, the colonials. So it, it was just a combination of, of all those things. It was one of those perfect storms that come together that Dunmore can no longer, you know, they're, we're calling for help. You know, we need help. We're losing families. We're losing settlements. We're losing land. And Dunmore puts together this, this great army that comes together to go and fight. That's, that was based, that's, the whole thing put in a real nutshell. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You said there was Cherokee that were also involved in some of this. Were there also like Stephen or is there other kind of tribes that were also involved in some of this? Um, most of the Indians are about here for the battle, Point Pleasant, or Shawnee, uh, Lenape, which are the Delaware, Mingo, Huron. They're mainly the northern tribes. There weren't, um, matter of fact, at the time of this, of um, Lord Dunmore's War, at the time of this battle, we're working on getting this, the Cherokee on our side. So um, there, weren't, there weren't Cherokee active, actively engaged with this battle. Now later we go, um, what, 10, 20, about 20 more years when we find Tecumseh coming in. Tecumseh's father was killed here in the Battle of Point Pleasant. Um, a lot of people don't know that if you've ever seen the, the Tecumseh show. Uh, he's killed in the Battle of Point Pleasant. Um, but the Cherokee are, are not involved. It, it's all the tribes north of the Ohio. So like I say, Shawnee, Lenape, Mingo, which is actually a part of the, the League of Nations, the Iroquois Nations. Um, they were sort of the go-betweens. But we find them fighting with them also because now they're being looked down upon by, by the, the League of Nations as well. Uh, Huron, some of the upper um, Ohio Indians all of them coming together in this. And that's, as soon as the battle's over, they go back, they all leave. <laughs> and Cornstalk is left by himself. So just main Shawnee was the main, main the, tribe? Yes, the Shawnee were the main, were the main force in this battle. Because they were smaller tribes, right, that were? Yes, yes. And they weren't strong enough to battle against, you know, bigger tribes or bigger enemies, right? So no. If they would have all fought together, We'd still be living east of the Appalachians. But they couldn't work together. I think that's our problem now, isn't it? It's hard, hard, hard to work together. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Is there a connection between the fish tomahawk and the water panther stone? No. No, the, with the fish tomahawk, literally, there was a, one of the men, they were camped here several days. They were fishing, and they said they caught a great fish. And he had a tomahawk made uh, with a fish head. And I'm trying to think if it's in uh, one of the uh, accoutrements books that are out. You can find that fish head tomahawk in it. It was actually a pipe tomahawk. So, so it was fixed up as a pipe tomahawk. But it was just a great fish that they had caught. Did it have anything to do with the, with, um, uh, the panther stone? No, the water panther, actually, right? Any other questions? I have a random question. How come there's not a lot of people out fishing on the river? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> why is it, why is, you know, we, we have such a beautiful place. I would think this place would be full of, of, of boats and everything. And you can go just up the river some, and there are a lot of boats around Parkersburg. You can go down the river, and there's a lot, I don't know, just not a lot of people that I know of. That's it. Any other questions? No more questions about the curse of Chief Cornstall. Has anybody heard the tie-in that, that the Mothman was actually Red Hawk the Delaware Indian coming back to warn uh, the people of Point Pleasant of this danger? 
I've heard that story. I've heard that story as well. All kinds of different stories. But that's a, that's a brief history of Point Pleasant. Thank you all very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of the time here. Come back in a few weeks for, for battle race.